Hey folks, sorry about the lack of uploads recently. I have been working on an absolutely massive review of John Green's The Anthropocene Reviewed, and that's just my only YouTube focus right now. This video, to that point, was originally part of that review. I wrote, shot, and edited this, and um, then decided it didn't actually fit, but I'd already done all the work, so uh, I figured I should, I should show it to all y'all because I think it's pretty good. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the fun little thing that happens two thirds of the way through has been spoiled by this video existing on its own as opposed to part of an anthology of sorts. But you know, I think you'll still enjoy it. So uh, please do that and I will see you all soon. There's something oddly impactful about using a metal credit card. It confers no tangible benefits over plastic and in fact is kind of a hassle to replace because you can't just put the thing in a shredder. But when it comes time to whip it out and you feel that slight extra heft and rigidity in your hand, the act of commerce suddenly has more, for lack of a better term, weight. And maybe that's a good thing. Part of the reason credit cards can be so dangerous is how effortless it is to swipe, tap, or jam one piece of plastic into another. Every transaction feels the same, and if it feels like nothing, well, you're just a little bit more likely to charge that thing you don't need and maybe don't even really want. But whether that's a real phenomena, it is obviously not why banks are moving towards premium materials. Rather, it is about offering the illusion of status. Because once upon a time, having a metal credit card did confer that. In 1999, American Express introduced the Centurion card, colloquially known as the black card, due to the coloring of its titanium plate. A previous black-colored Amex card that was never publicly advertised was discontinued in the late 80s, but in the decade that followed, rumors abounded that maybe the card never went away and was still available to the most elite customers. That wasn't true until it was. There's plenty of speculation about what actually gets someone invited, but its $10,000 initiation fee and $5,000 annual upkeep are for sure, and the rumored spending requirements of between a quarter and half million dollars each year make the whole thing sound like a yacht. If you have to ask, you can't afford it. And as with anything else that most people can't afford, it became a status symbol, getting name dropped by the likes of Kanye West and Busta Rhymes. Imitators, of course, followed, with companies releasing their own black cards, capitalizing on the name's cachet at a fraction of the price, and of course, the build quality as well. Titanium is a lot less impressive now that the Amazon Prime Visa card is made of it too. I've held a real black card though, a proper American Express Centurion, and my first thought was, you could probably kill someone with this, not because it was heavy, but because it was weirdly sharp. My second thought was, I wonder if their private concierge would help you get off on those murder charges. I held it because a colleague wanted to flex his family's wealth and flashed it in the office. He's one of those guys whose primary personality trait is the fact that his parents are rich as fuck, which makes it weird that he works in an office with the likes of me, but whatever. Most of our interactions follow the same format. He walks over, says something slightly suspect that I groan about, and then makes a joke about being a rich white man and the fact that I, while not rich, am somehow still bougie enough for his sensibilities. Also, he uses my Netflix password because no one loves free stuff more than rich people. And I just don't care. I'm paying for it anyway. I don't know. Two X's are on my Spotify family plan, so. And sure, there's a part of me that wishes I had sheltered in place in his New Jersey mansion instead of my then 400 square foot apartment but that same part would have been just as happy in a whole lot of places that cost a whole lot less than even that apartment. It's all relative. Until it's not. Being in the presence of an actual billionaire is wild. It's only happened to me once, more than 20 years ago, when they weren't really in the public eye like they are now. You see, a childhood friend of my mom's married into the Hearst family, the Citizen Kane one. 
and we went to visit one of their homes. The first thing I noticed was that their greenhouse was around the size of my parents' people house, but two moments from that day really burned into my mind, both involving water. The first was sitting in a pool that looked down the football field that was their yard onto their private dock. When I turned around, I saw through an enormous bay window the personal chef cooking dinner with ingredients I had never heard of. And if that's not some king shit, I don't know what is. That's a lie. Somewhere in this palatial estate was a fairly small, unassuming room containing nothing but a ping pong table. Now, that was pretty cool on its own for a nine-year-old, but after a few rounds, they pushed the table out of the way, pressed a little button in the wall, and the fucking floor opened up, revealing a wave pool. <laughs> so if you're ever wondering what sort of dumb shit rich people spend their money on when they aren't paying people to build rocket-powered dicks, it's indoor wave pools that they hide under ping pong tables. And I have spent basically my entire conscious life aware of that. And also the fact that I will never be one of those people. And that's fine. I was taught from an early age that wealth doesn't really mean anything. Having money is great, and it makes a lot of things a lot easier. But rich people aren't better than everyone else, and much of the time, they're worse. My parents dedicated themselves to helping the homeless, and the mentally ill, and children in the foster system, and unfortunately, jobs where you're helping people don't pay nearly as well as those where you're fucking them. If there was any sort of economic justice, they would make a lot more than the men in suits who deny loans to the elderly. But that ain't the world we live in. And learning about the world from people who decided to do good for it makes the idea of riches at its expense fundamentally unpleasant. And most riches are, so bring back the guillotines, right? John Green agrees with at least part of that. Five years ago, a user on Quora asked why Green was worth only $5 million, presumably having found that number from some suspect celebrity net worth site. Many people responded, most notably, John Green. And while he wasn't about to out his bank account on Quora, his three-part answer is illuminating. One. When we imagine that people's net worth is directly correlated with the value as a person or professional, I think we give money too much power. Two, in my admittedly limited experience, the internet is not particularly good at telling you how much money someone has. And three, my family is incredibly lucky and privileged to have financial security, but I'm not sure what money can do beyond providing financial security. Like, I am not in need of a yacht. I feel like owning a yacht would stress me out. Fair enough. No, it always comes back to yachts, doesn't it? A and why not? They are the quintessential rich boy toy. Or were until the billionaires decided they wanted to be astronauts. Not because they're expensive to buy, which they certainly are, but because they're hugely expensive to maintain. To keep one up and running requires an additional 10 to 20% of the purchase price every single year. It's where the saying that I used at the beginning of this comes from. If you need to ask, if you even need to think about the numbers that would be involved in making that work, you can't afford it and really shouldn't try. But that's clearly not the stress Green is talking about. So he can apparently afford a yacht. And you know what? Good for him. Capitalism comes up a few times in the Anthropocene Reviewed by implication and name. Always negatively. Sometimes it's an offhand reference, as in his digression on The Great Gatsby in reviewing Our Capacity for Wonder. Other times it's the whole damn point, as with the grocery chain Piggly Wiggly or the board game Monopoly. In all cases, the paratextual success of the author makes the comments read like something of a victory lap, punches thrown by a man who has won capitalism, but also I hate that phrase. I know that we're all about competition or whatever here, but think about it. When someone has won, who lost? Because it sure as fuck wasn't capitalism. And I think being a creative multi-hyphenate is one of the less harmful ways to become rich, but just as not everyone wins the economy the same way, not everyone loses the same either. 
Living in Manhattan changes your relationship with money in profound ways. Most notably, you lose context for the value of items. The rest of the world suddenly becomes cheap. A couple years ago, a colleague came back from Disney World, and the first thing he said to me in utter disbelief was, I thought the food prices at the park were reasonable. And yeah, burgers cost $15, and that probably doesn't include fries. My rent in this one-bedroom apartment is close to double the country's median mortgage payment, and that is after a 22% reduction resulting from last year's pandemic-led exodus from this neighborhood, and I genuinely believe that I got a deal. Fucking Whole Foods is the affordable option when compared to your typical Manhattan grocer. But despite all of that, I got sticker shock the first time I walked into Saks Fifth Avenue. I didn't really understand the hierarchy of department stores yet. I was used to Macy's prices and thought maybe they'd be like slightly higher. I wasn't ready for three-figure t-shirts and four-figure hoodies. Still, I made a game of uh, trying to guess the cost, and I was never correct. Or, or even close. At some point, I found myself staring at a jacket with an enormous tiger sewn into the back. It was $5,000. I pulled it off the rack, tried it on, laughed very hard at what I saw in the mirror. I couldn't imagine wanting to own that, let alone putting down five grand for the privilege. But just as being in New York makes $15 burgers seem reasonable, being around those astronomically expensive items made the occasional sale rack in the store seem downright cheap. And I don't know what drove it exactly, but when I found a cool blue t-shirt from a brand I had never heard of called Theory, the mark down to $70 felt totally reasonable, despite the fact that I had never spent more than like $30 on a t-shirt up to that point. When I was younger, I almost exclusively wore oversized black t-shirts with angry slogans alongside baggy cargo pants. There was a t-shirt slash gay porn shop in Provincetown, Massachusetts called Don't Panic that was my go-to for screen-printed remarks about how my hate was divided equally amongst everyone, or that this was the part where I nodded to act like I was listening. A few of them made it to college, but over its course I calmed down a lot, saw those shirts for what they were. And with that revelation came a pretty dramatic change to my wardrobe. My angry black shirts were replaced with solid, unadorned colors. My cargo pants became jeans and chinos. After I switched from Don't Panic to Banana Republic, I distinctly remember looking in the mirror and thinking that if my younger self could see what he would become, he probably would have just ended things right there, like he always wanted to. And I thought, good. I was awful. In the years since that fateful first foray into Saks, my wardrobe has gotten pricier but even more homogenous. Shorts, shirts, the black suit that I bought because I wanted to look like Cher Young from Itzy in the one dance video, all from theory. Of course, I never bought any of it full price because it's, it's a lot of money. Always the sales section or the outlet store where it's still not cheap, but it's reasonable if you believe, as I do, that it's worth spending a little bit more for something a little bit nicer that will last a little bit longer. This perhaps is why I am bougie enough for my black card carrying colleague. So perhaps it was inevitable that when the time came for me to release merch for the channel, I put everyone's money where my mouth is. While fulfillment company Printful has dozens of options for blanks upon which they can print number one of the week I review Superfan Willow's dope designs, I was rather limited by the fact that actual people likely to buy merch for this channel live all over the world. The week I review shirts have shipped to three continents thus far, so global fulfillment was critical. I chose three well-reviewed options, meaning that criteria at three different price points, $7, $13, and $17, and had samples made. I was hoping the middle ground would be the one, a solid option that would feel good and allow me to charge a little bit less than the $25 standard that I think most merch hits, rather than a little bit more. It did not. Of the three, 
I only enjoyed wearing the Bella and Canvas 3413. Though another colleague who co-founded a streetwear brand that sells pretty cool stuff and so asked me to bring in the samples because obviously he's interested in that kind of thing, thought that even the $7 one was a solid option, which probably says something about both of us. And that was that. I'm obviously not going to attach my name to a piece of clothing that I wouldn't wear, and we have established that I think I am too good for cheap things. I don't love that every time someone buys a shirt, I pay anywhere between $16.95 and $19.99 to have it printed, but it's worth it. And anyway, merch was never supposed to be a big money maker for me. None of this was. Three years on, the Week I Review has a handful of revenue streams adding up to a few hundred dollars a month, and that's great. It's a few hundred dollars that I wouldn't have otherwise. Plus, every once in a while, it's more. By the time my review of Bo Burnham's Inside hit 100,000 views, it had made around $400 in ad revenue. Nothing to sneeze at. But at the same time, not nearly enough to even consider building a career on. But if we extrapolate that in order of magnitude and say that a video hit a million views, an absurd number that would almost single-handedly double my channel's current count, $4,000 for a video could be a game changer. I might have to actually pay taxes on that instead of just putting it in an income expense report that my parents' accountant laughs at and disregards. A few months back, I decided that I wanted to have one pair of, like, nice jeans, so I went to Nordstrom to see what they had, and, of course, I took the opportunity to look at some of the fancier items on display as well. One item caught my eye, a shirt on the Saint Laurent rack. Usually, designer t-shirts don't interest me. As I said, I shifted hard to solid colors with nary a logo in sight, but the high-end tie-dye just struck me. I never felt drawn to a shirt quite like that, and for the first time in my nearly 30 years on this planet, I thought maybe it would be worth having a ritzy logo on my chest. I'd like the design more without, but, you know, it's pretty subtle as those things go. I played my little game, $300, I guessed, already a preposterous amount to spend on a t-shirt. <laughs> but I wasn't ready for the reality. $490 plus tax. I shouldn't have been surprised, of course. St. Laurent has one of those stores where literally the entire stock is clearly visible from the street. Socially distanced product placement that, given the cost of rent in Midtown, Soho, etc., guarantees eye-watering prices on every single item. I left the store with a decent new pair of jeans, but I kept thinking about that damn shirt. And I made myself a promise. If I got to a million views on a video, I would buy myself a $500 t-shirt. Because why the fuck not? And so I, I thought it would be funny to review the idea of this shirt and what it meant and said about me that I had made a hypothetical milestone celebration so stupidly superficial. And then I thought of something even funnier. Actually buying it. So I did. Let's try it on, shall we?
I don't, I don't really know what I was expecting. If we're being entirely honest, it's, it's not like I thought the heavens would open and angels would come down in a chorus, but I, I really did think I would feel something positive. I really do like this design a lot and the idea of going from never wearing a logo to putting fucking Saint Laurent on my chest. It's, it's, it, it is funny to me. Like it, it's the sort of committing to the bit that I really strive for in my life. And I guess this is also committing to a bit, but it's a very different joke that I'm making. And maybe if it was the original joke, I would feel better if I had done this ridiculous thing to celebrate another ridiculous thing, I would be happy. The only thing I am right now is stressed. Wearing this is, 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 is really stressing me out. It's not like I've irreparably stained a shirt before or done anything that would give me reason to think that I'm about to destroy this, but honestly, it's hot in here and I'm worried about the fact that after two minutes I'm sweating into it and that's a problem. I can't, I, I can't be worried about that if I want to wear this or anything like this. And maybe it's obvious that a $500 t-shirt could never feel worth it to someone for whom $500 is a lot of money, but it's, it's, it's not even that comfortable. Like it doesn't feel like any other shirt I've ever worn and that's interesting and whatever, but the material is kind of flimsy feeling. It's not nearly as pleasant to touch as you'd think. And that's, and it's, it's weird. Why? Obviously it's, it's about the name on the front, but I've always believed that there was more to it. Like I really did believe that it wasn't just the name, but I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm, I, I can see that it's, it's not. That's, that's all there is. I, I, I don't know why that makes me as sad as it does. Glad I kept the receipt. I give the tie-dye Saint Laurent Reeve Gauche t-shirt in deep green two stars. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, Hamry and Marco, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, Magnolia Denton, Elliot Fowler, Greg Lucina, Liam Knipe, Kojo, Willow, Phil Bates, I Am The Sword, Timo, Riley Zimmerman, and the folks who'd rather be read than said. If you like this video, that's great because this is sort of what the next review is gonna be like, but with a lot more of it. If you didn't, I, this channel ain't for you, fam. Uh, but I hope to see you. I hope to see you then.